who was head of the weapons, a uh, lot of the weapons work at Sandia in Albuquerque, and now head systems analysis in uh, Livermore. And uh, she's supposed to be speaking on nuclear posture review and deterrence. Uh, also next week, a man so will give his own lecture on North Korea. Here are the slides, they're terrific. And took, as you know, as a major in the Korean army, South Korean army. And uh, has a lot to share with you about North Korea. And that's important because next week at some point, we're gonna hand out the material for the crisis simulation exercise. And it's received knowledge of uh, North Korea and Northeast Asia is quite important on that simulation. You'll each have an assigned role and we'll go over that in class next week. Um, and then uh, uh, the following week, the final week of classes, uh, there's a guest, Kim Bridell from Lawrence Livermore Lab on the Stockpile Stewardship Program. That's the 21st and then on the 22nd, then on the 24th is the crisis simulation exercise. And we'll need to uh, leave some time at the end of that because there is a required course evaluation by computer that you have to fill out. It's gonna take about 15 minutes. So we have to end at least 15 minutes early on the 24th. You all received Eric's uh, write-up on guidance for the project. And then uh, there'll be a uh, presentation and discussion by you guys on the, on the 29th. And on the 1st, Carla and I'll provide some final thoughts. So that's coming attractions for the rest of the semester. And then it's the, uh, the 12th or 13th, it's Monday for your presentation. And we tend to invite people from various departments. We usually get a decent crowd. I have to reconfirm that it will be in this room. Uh, because sometimes even though we have the room at this hour, other classes schedule final exams and the campus can put them in this room. So I don't yet have absolute confirmation it will be in this room. So stay tuned for that. Any other questions on coming attractions? Okay. So let's now turn to Iran. Some of you may know a good deal about Iran, some of you may know absolutely zero about Iran. So I'm going to sort of start from the beginning. That's the flag. That's where it's located in Southwest Asia, surrounded by a lot of interesting countries like Iraq, Turkey. Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, and very importantly, he bodies of water in the Persian Gulf, and then the Straits of Hormuz, which is one of the major navigational choke points in the world for important shipping. Uh, has a little over 80 million people, which makes it the second most populous country in the Middle East. Um, it's the second largest country in area to Saudi Arabia. But Iran is not Arab, but very few people speak Arabic. Only 2% of the Iranian population speaks Arabic. They tend to speak Persian or Farsi, and a minority speaks Azerbaijan. Um, I mentioned this. So, reorient yourself to this part of the world. It's a long distance from the United States. It's been adjacent to Iraq, and Iraq and Iran are two of the most uh, prolific oil producers in the world, and they're the two largest countries with a Shia majority. You know, again, for those who didn't follow this, when Muhammad died, the founder of Muslim religion, 
he didn't leave explicit instructions for who would succeed him. It developed over the decades a huge argument whether the leader should be a direct descendant of Muhammad, a blood relative, or should be one of his principal advisors or one of their advisors. Um, the Muslim world split into two groups. The majority group supported the view it should be the top advisor to Muhammad. And they became known as the Sunni. And today there are about one billion Sunnis. Minority believe it should be a blood relative of Muhammad, and they are the Shia. The Shia have 300 some odd million followers, the majority of whom are in Iran and Iraq. Other countries that have Shia, the Muslims are Azerbaijan, and uh, Azerbaijan is a Shia person. Here, it is Azerbaijan. There, I once had a dinner meeting in Azerbaijan, the most alcohol I ever had in my life. <laughs> and they sit on uh, mats with your legs folded. And afterward, I could not rise. It took several of them to pick me up. It took me several days to recover. Uh, the capital of Azerbaijan, as you get there for the next day or two, is Baku, mm -hmm. which is a huge oil producer as well. So it's a very large international uh, petroleum community is in Azerbaijan. And they are Shia. And uh, also in the, in the Persian Gulf, you can see it in that, but Bahrain, Bahrain somewhere. It's Bahrain. Oh, the pink. Pink color. Yeah. yeah. This the Bahrain is also Shia majority. And finally, in the Middle East, Lebanon has a growing Shia population. It's not yet a majority, but it soon will be. And Lebanon also houses Hezbollah, who are the main. Uh, uh, Shia group in Lebanon, they're supported by the Iranians militarily and financially, and they are a sworn enemy of Israel. So uh, the Shia are in a few countries only, but they're not the majority of the Arab world, we assume. Any questions about that? Um, you need to know a little bit about how Iran got to where it is. This, uh, this. Uh, Iran was of course, if you're going back to ancient times, the great empire, the Persian Empire, if you read any biblical account of the ancient times, Persia looms very large. In more modern times, in the 1920s, it was established a dynasty of monarchy under a family called the Pahlavi family. And the Pahlavi family established the imperial state of Persia in the Western world, which the king of Iran, king of Persia, had changed to Iran in 1935. So if we were meeting here in the early 1930s, this wouldn't be called Iran, we call the imperial state of Persia, but since 1935, it's been called Iran. A uh, key development arose in 1953. There was a very prominent political figure in Iran at the time named Mossadegh. There's his photo there. And he was freely elected as the prime minister in 1953. Uh, 
Mossadegh was a socialist in terms of his economic philosophy and had some pro-Soviet inclinations. This was during 53, this is the height of the Cold War. The British, he also then, see, the British had a big oil company in Iran, which he seen, he nationalized the British oil holdings in Iran. Um, Eisenhower and Churchill, who was back in power again, collaborated and decided that most of that needed to be overthrown. This had actually been originally discussed with Truman, but Truman had opposed it, saying it was illegal. But in 52, Truman didn't run, Eisenhower was elected, and Eisenhower agreed with Churchill that Mossadegh should be overthrown. This is the first time the US Special Forces, the CIA, led an operation to overthrow a freely elected government in peacetime. So this is a non-trivial development. They didn't kill Mossadegh, he was just for the next hour, he stayed in exile in Iran. He died in his late 80s. This is a joint uh, MI5 CIA operation. The father of the, the, the son of the father, Reza was the father, who will change the name. By this time, he had died, and monarchy was passed on to his son, um, Muhammad Pahlavi, who we know as the Shah of Iran. He has uh, a few medals he collected over the years. Um, the Shah became a very pro-Western, modernizing leader, not a democratic leader. He was deeply authoritarian. He established the Savak, which was a CIA-trained secret police that arrested and tortured opponents of his regime. Um, he was, however, anti-Soviet and supported U.S. policies in the Cold War against the Soviet Union. The Savak. So no democratic attributes. He was an authoritarian monarch. Yes. So, uh, did the did sort of the structure of government in Iran go from a monarchy to democracy back to monarchy? It never really was a democracy. It was an election. Okay. But uh, honestly, they hardly ruled at all. He didn't get a chance to change into the government. But during the time he was the prime minister, was there still also a shock? Yes, oh, okay. he was the Muhammad Pahlavi was a shot, but he didn't have the power that he had once the U.S. and Britain overthrew the Muslims. Then the Shah really assumed enormous power. Also critically important, this is a country, a Shia country, deeply religious, especially in the rural areas, and the Shah was blatantly irreligious. He rarely went to the mosques. He never went to uh, the holy sites of Islam in Saudi Arabia. He went to, instead to St. Moritz to ski. Uh, he led a good life, but that was very much resented by most of the religious people in Iran, especially in the rural areas uh, throughout his tenure. I think he and his family were largely Zoroastrian. Zoroastrian, that's right. Yeah. So that's a slightly different yeah, totally. version. Right. Uh, moving to more modern times in the 1970s, when Carter was present, he invited the Shah to visit him. And in a very famous Carter speech, it was national televised. He called the Shah an island of stability in the sea of turmoil. But this guy is very stable. He's a core ally of ours. This whole place is a little frenetic. Practically, as soon as he said stability, all hell broke loose in the run. <laughs> and there were frequent anti Shah demonstrations throughout 1977 and 1978. 
led to a spiraling of killing of demonstrators by the police, followed by a mourning period where uh, people, you know, shared in their grief over the killings, followed by new demonstrators, followed by new killings. Each time it was a growing opposition to the show. And Carter became increasingly alarmed about the future of the show. Remember, Iran, adjacent here to Turkmenistan, this is part of the Soviet Union in the Cold War. These countries are not independent countries. Azerbaijan, Armenia, which is nearby, Turkmenistan, these are republics of the Soviet Union. This is Soviet territory. The Soviet tanks and aircraft right on the Iranian border. It turned the Second World War, the Soviet Union invaded Iraq. So the U.S. was very fearful that a pro-Soviet leader in Iran would give the Soviets a huge archery into the Middle East and the oil. And this was considered uh, absolutely anathema to U.S. policy. Um, as the demonstrations kept growing, uh, one of the clerics who had been exiled, Ayatollah Khomeini, Ayatollah Bohala Khomeini, there he is, he had been in exile since 1964 in Paris. And he began to send, this was of course way before the email of the computer world, he began to send audio tapes of the smuggled into Iran, exhorting the population to overthrow the Shah. And by experts in the field, they say he spoke beautiful Farsi and was tremendously inspirational to the population to overthrow the Shah. And you see one crowd uh, demonstrating against the Shah and supporting the guy. So, who's still in Paris? In Paris. There's a, uh, back when the Shah was an island of stability in the sea of turmoil, there's President Carter with the Shah back in 77. People didn't know that the Shah was suffering from terminal cancer condition, and the Shah was himself very uncertain how to deal with the protesters between appeasing them and declaring martial law and coming down hard on them. Uh, and as things worsened, he grew less uncertain what to do. Carter was in touch with him. Some members of Carter's cabinet wanted the U.S. to intervene militarily to save the Shah, but Carter didn't want to do that. So there was no U.S. force to support the Shah's forces to suppress the rebellion. In the fall of 1978, Foreign Affairs, which we've mentioned a few times, is very prominent journal that's written and read by diplomats and political figures all over the world and by scholars. Uh, by the early fall, they wanted to do a, a, a paper on Iran and its future. But it turned out there were very few American scholars who really knew Iran well, very few over all these decades. One was a man named James Bill, who was a professor of political science at the University of Texas at Austin. He was fluent in Farsi, he had married an Iranian, he had lived in Iran for a long time. He was considered about the most knowledgeable American scholar who could give a dispassionate analysis of what's going to happen in Iran. This paper was revised as late as early December 1978. And when it came out, it said, Bill said that there were five options for the future of Iran. One is that the Shah will retain power, which Bill thought was now unlikely. The second was that the power would be transferred to his family. The name of the monarch was called the Peacock Throne. He had a very attractive wife and son. Bill thought it was possible he would relinquish the power to his wife and son. The third was that uh, many of the parliamentarians who spoke French and had lived in southern France, who were social democrats, more or less, by Western standards, who take power. The fourth was that there would be a military coup, the Iranian military would overthrow the Shah. And the fifth would be that the Tudor party, the 
small communist party in Iran to take power. Of course, what's missing from the list is an Islamic theocracy. He never thought there was any prospect of an Islamic theocracy taking power in Iran. He was the best expert at Iran in the United States. Two weeks after this was published, the Shah fled Iran. The CIA was actually unaware of his cancerous condition. So the US was completely blindsided. And later on, in, uh, so he abdicated. He hopped around, he went to Egypt where Sadat supported him, greeted him welcomingly. He went to Morocco, it's another pro Western Middle East country. He was in the Bahamas for a while, in Mexico. Then Carter made a decision. The Iranians warned Carter, don't allow him to come to the US for medical treatment. He should die if they wanted to get him back and probably pull out his fingernails. Uh, Carter allowed the Shah to enter New York for medical treatment. Then he went to Panama, then went back to Egypt, and he died in 1979 at the age of 60. He was a young man. Uh, remember from the origins with the Mossadegh overthrow that the Shah was always viewed as illegitimate by many Iranian institutions sold by the West. And uh, this was the West and the U.S. interfering in Iranian affairs. And then in February 1979, with the Shah out of the country, was Ayatollah Khomeini coming down of an Air France plane from Paris, returning to his homeland. And there are people all at the airport waiting to greet him. He was a tremendously popular, charismatic, inspirational leader for the vast majority of Iranians, even though they really didn't know what he stood for, other than that. He was, he was a pious man, he was a deeply religious man, he was a known theocrat. He was a known contributor to the literature on uh, Shia Islam. He quickly established a totalitarian theocracy. No democracy of any kind. He and his colleagues determined all proper behavior. Uh, he declared the United States as the great Satan and declared his primary goal was death to Israel. There it is on February 1st. This is a huge defeat for Carter. Obviously, a catastrophic defeat for Carter. Uh, shortly thereafter, totally out of the blue, a separate struggle develops. Iraq attacks Iran. <laughs> Iraq was led by Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein controlled a lot of the oil. Obviously, in the world, including Iraq, he reasoned that if he could seize Iran, collectively, he would have a stranglehold on the oil in the world. He would be one of the world's leaders. Remember, Saddam Hussein was Sunni, governing a Shia country. They fought a brutal, gruesome eight year war. This has particular details of the where the armies fought, I'm going to sit over that. Um, Reagan, and then, oh, Reagan replaced uh, Carter after also another failure of Carter, which is a hostage rescue mission, which I'll discuss in a minute. So Reagan's initial uh, decision that was confirmed with, who does he side in the war between Iraq and Iran? And he decided to side with Iraq on the grounds that Iraq was governed by your typical military junta authoritarian leader, whereas Iran was governed by a theocrat with a set of ideas which were threatening to the West. And the ideas were more powerful than uh, the military. 
So the U.S. in 1980 to 1988, less well known to folks, provided aid to Baghdad in their support of the war against Iran, and they had initiated the war. But the U.S. policy isn't always the model of existence. Uh, after eight years of struggle, it ended in the stalemate. Iraq never got hold of the Iranian territory with oil in it, and Iran, since tried to overthrow Saddam Hussein, failed in that. There's a lot of killing and no uh, no resolution. And in fact, uh, Iraq did use uh, chemical weapons against Iranians in that war. How many of you are familiar with any of this history at all? How many of you are familiar with any of it? Zero. Two or three. Quite important in thinking about the nuclear situation today. In 1989, Khomeini died. He was a great leader, but he was human. <laughs> and he's replaced by a man with almost the same name. Ayatollah Khamenei. Khamenei replaced Khomeini, just to keep you on your toes. And Khamenei didn't have any of the prestige of Khomeini. He was not a great religious figure, he was a political figure. And he has been in charge of Iran from 1989 till this afternoon. Uh, Iran in the meantime goes through presidential elections. The president is the highest official underneath the Ayatollah, who's the supreme leader in the in the Iranian constitution. The Ayatollah, who's selected by a group of Muslim clerics alone, is the supreme leader. Uh, the current leader, the current uh, prime minister is Hassan Rouhani, who's considered a moderate, and he was actually the one who encouraged Iranian negotiations with the U.S. on the JCPOA, the Iranian nuclear group. He had succeeded Ahmadinejad. Ahmadinejad was deeply anti-U.S. He was one of the youngsters who seized the U.S. Embassy in 1979, which led to the hostage crisis. Do you have that next? Yeah. It's slightly out of date geographically, but it's very important. In November 1979, the same year, remember Khomeini returned from Paris in February 1979. That same year, Iranians, there they are, these are all Iranian, but an Iranian mob, seized the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. The U.S. retained diplomatic relations with Iran after Khomeini uh, came to power. They seized the embassy and they held 52 hostages for 444 days. That's a year and a quarter. Um, Carter uh, did not ever give an order for the Marines to fire on the Marine guards, remember U.S. Embassy, uh, not to fire on the uh, Guys climbing the fences. He could have. He could have had a big shootout there. He chose not to. So they busted down the doors and seized all these people. And these hostages were held for a year and a quarter. This was a global news story all over the world. Every day, what's the status of the hostages? Uh, I know you people don't watch television. But there's a program that became very famous called Nightline, which is on the ABC television network. It was started during the hostage crisis. And the moderator was a man named Ted Koppel, who became very famous um, as a newsman covering the hostage crisis. Lots of discussion over the years what we would do. Could we negotiate with them? You know, what could happen? Um, in 1980, that's a presidential election year, be aware, during presidential election years, things are going to happen. We're going to have a presidential election year next year, fasten your seatbelt. 
<laughs> Especially with this guy. Best in the seat. Uh, 1980, the economy was not doing well. Uh, the hostages were still being held. Carter was persuaded by his advisors to authorize a rescue mission to, to get the hostages out of Iran. It included eight helicopters and one aircraft that were going to land in the desert. And then special forces were going to get up to Tehran and somehow seize the hostages from Iranian guards. This was a very well fortified embassy. Uh, would, would have been a big shootout to get them out of there. Unfortunately, uh, the weather intervened. There was a terrible sandstorm. At the time the helicopters landed, sand got in the gears of a couple of the helicopter blades, two of the helicopters, and one of the aircraft crashed. That greatly reduced the capability of the rescue crew. And uh, once Carter was informed of that, he called off the mission. And Carter was a military man. He was a U.S. Naval officer, he graduated from mm -hmm. the Naval Academy, nuclear submariner. He wasn't, you know, a Berkeley demonstrator. He was a hard-nosed guy, but he pulled out of the crisis. There was also a crisis within the government. Cyrus Vance, who was the Secretary of State, was very much opposed to the rescue mission, and he resigned which also made Houston in the middle of a crisis he resigned because he opposed Carter's decision to rescue God. There he is, uh, Time Magazine, very prominent, 19 the time. The Bible in the desert is part of the whole press. An attempt to rescue the American hostages in Iran was aborted Friday when eight crew members of the U.S. were killed President Carter accepts full responsibility. Great abandonment. There's still some speculators who claim if somehow the hostages were rescued, Carter would have won the election. This is in April. The election is in November 1980. Uh, the rescue mission was a failure. The election, Carter was slaughtered by Reagan. And Reagan became president. There is a big deal of office, former veneer of national rule. Now, one interesting thing that happened is right after his Reagan being sworn in by Chief Justice Warren Berger, and that's Nancy Reagan over there, this is January 20th, 1981. The whole time there were negotiations with the Iranians about getting the hostages back, but they hadn't yielded any results. Afterward, it was questioned whether. Reagan and his vice president, George H.W. Bush, did any negotiations with the Iranians behind the scenes to delay the release of the hostages. And if you wait until Reagan gets in, you'll get a better deal. It was never proved. I have one slight personal angle on this. I was a PhD student at Columbia in the 70s, a few years before this. And I was part of a study group, a PhD students study for their exams together. I don't know if that means engineering, but we did it. No. And uh, there was a four person group, and one member of my group was a man named, funny name, Gary Sick, S I C K, but he wasn't sick. <laughs> and Gary Sick was a naval officer, he was a US Navy commander. And, and we both got our PhDs in 73. And he briefly went back to the Pentagon and then he joined the Carter National Security Council staff, NSC staff. And he was the point man on Iran during the whole hostage crisis. He was the single point advisor to Carter on Iran. And he later claimed that he thought he had evidence that Reagan and Bush were secretly urging the Iranians to stall on the lease of the negotiations in order for Reagan to get elected. Um, it ultimately led to congressional hearings. Reagan, uh, Sick wrote a book, it was a very prominent book at the time, called All Fall Down. How everybody lost as a result of the Iranian, election, Iranian uh, revolution. Um, 
there were congressional hearings, but they were not uh, definitive. There was no definitive proof that Reagan and Bush were uh, involved, complicit in the negotiation store on, on the elections. Never, never fully resolved. But within minutes after Berger swore in Reagan, the Iranians announced that they were releasing the hostages. Within minutes. And all 52 hostages were released unharmed. Some of them suffered terrible post traumatic stress disorder, but they were all unharmed. On January 20th, the same day as Reagan was inaugurated, the hostages were released right after the inauguration. So that gives you some background. Yeah. Uh, there is a good movie to understand the Iranian crisis, which is named Argo, A R G O. Yes, Argo, that's right. Ben Affleck. Yeah, ben Affleck, that's right. That was also an effort to uh, get, get the hostages out. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, so, in the meantime, what's the nuclear situation? Well, again, going back one uh, anecdote, although Carl could comment on this. I was. Uh, in Cambridge at the Kennedy School at Harvard in the 1970s and 80s, and had many good buddies in uh, MIT, including nuclear engineering. And I was told that more than half the graduate students in nuclear engineering in the 1970s were from Iran. I don't know if you had that, but you were there before. Jay Davis, uh, well, I finished my PhD at 76, and oh. his freshman 68, yeah. and there I knew a lot of Iranians in MIT. Right. Jay Davis, uh, who I talked about as being the guy who was part of UNSCOM Team 4 that went in to discover the Iraqi program uh, in 1992. Uh, he was the, he called it the, his Indiana Jones days. But he goes, and he gave this popular talk about the, both the Iranian and the Iraqi programs. And he, he'd go to the University of Texas and he'd go to MIT and he'd go to Berkeley and so forth. And then he'd actually show, for example, in the Iraqi program, he'd actually show the leadership of you know, the whole structure of the nuclear weapons program there. And then, and then there'd be kind of a pale light. And he said, and these are your graduates. <laughs> I'll tell one story about the Iranians. I taught here as a, I, in fact, the reason I had this historical connection with the department is I taught here for one year, 1977 to 1978. Uh, I taught nuclear engineering 201, the graduate course. At that time, there were very few Americans taking it. It was a small department, mostly international students. And there were two Iranian students. Uh, one of them I gave a C to, and he was sort of pissed off by that. And uh, actually took me to dinner. I, I was a little bit naive. You shouldn't allow this to happen. Thinking I would change the grade, and I didn't. He was still in the thought about it. So I take responsibility that they actually developed the bomb program. So <laughs> he probably went back and was the leader of the bomb program. <laughs> So it turned out we later learned that the Shah had wanted an Iranian nuclear program going back to the 70s, going back to the early 70s, before he was ever overthrown. Because the Shah visualized, he once made a statement that he thought Iran would become the fourth or fifth most powerful country in the world. The US, the Soviet Union, Japan, and Germany, which were economic behemoths at the time, and then Iran. And he thought in order for Iran to be a global power, it needed nuclear weapons. So he clearly had authorized a smart Iranian college students to go to the US. They also went to Imperial College London and other great centers of learning on nuclear matters. Um, but this was, I think, a somewhat dormant situation for a number of years under the Ayatollah. Uh, and then I think after the Iraqi war ended in the late 80s, he said, we need nuclear weapons too, because we're in a rough neighborhood. Israel already was thought had nuclear weapons. So it made good sense from an Iranian national perspective to acquire nuclear weapons. And then after the Soviet Union collapsed at the end of 1991, the Soviet Union was in the, Russia was in the business of selling a few things it had, one which is nuclear energy technology. So they sold nuclear, nuclear reactors 
to uh, to Iran. Iran's first nuclear reactor was purchased from the Russians. Now, Iran, by the way, was a member of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, but they were, uh, they claimed they were, you know, not seeking nuclear weapons, they were using this reactor for nuclear energy. And they're in Natan, the these are the top uh, facilities, Natanz and Fordo, hugely important uh, nuclear facilities in Iran. So by the early 2000s, they're developing the uranium enrichment program. Remember, the key thing for nuclear proliferation, you can have all the aspirations you want, but if you don't have the weapons grade material, you're not going to get very far. In order to get the weapons grade material, you want to take uh, uranium, enrich it using centrifuges, and then get enough U-235 for weapons. So they had uh, the Bushir nuclear facility developed with Russian assistance. They had some mines of their own. They had very smart engineers for weapon design and bomb design. And this was moving along in the early 2000s, the early part of the century. Now, uh, under both Shahs, Shah, uh, under both Ayatollahs, Khomeini and Khamenei, uh, Iran had uh, a, an unwavering commitment to the destruction of Israel. So we're going to wipe Israel off the map. So Israel, of course, took this quite seriously and was deeply concerned by the emergence of an Iranian nuclear program, which it was dedicated to them. So uh, uh, Israelis started using their own special forces, the Mossad, to attack and kill Iranian scientists. And there was a whole series of uh, assassinations where Iranian scientists and engineers would leave their home. They were usually picked up in limousines and driven to the nuclear facilities. And on several occasions, a motorcycle would pull up to the limousine and the rider on the motorcycle would push some sort of device onto the door of the limousine and swerve away, and the limousine would blow up. So there's a whole history to this. This is all very well documented. And a number of Iranian scientists and engineers, the key people, they targeted the key people, were killed. It was called targeted assassinations. And, and Israel said, we need to do this for our own security. It's better than killing millions of people. Um, the other thing that happened, so that, that's this. The other thing that happened was that uh, to spread out its capability, the Iranians purchased centrifuges, yeah, centrifuges from Siemens in Germany. Siemens is one of the largest manufacturers in the world of this kind of technology. They're world class. The Germans were not prohibited from providing this technology. It was for civilian nuclear power, although it could be used to get weapons grade material. And, uh, and it was recognized by both Israeli and American intelligence and others and the IAEA that, it, that Iran was quickly acquiring large amounts of weapons grade material. So then, that's you can see. No. So then, uh, Okay, I think there's something missing. In 2008, uh, George, w, George W. Bush was still president, and uh, Rumsfeld was sec had been Secretary of Defense. Rumsfeld had authorized that U.S. cyber programs be headquartered out at Stratcom, which is in Omaha, Nebraska under a very talented leader named James Cartwright, who was a Marine general. Usually outside the province of Marine generals, they're not usually too good on technology, land on beaches and kill people. Uh, but uh, 
Cartwright was an exceptionally smart guy. And uh, Cartwright came back to Bush in 2008 and told them that the US had a worm that could be infiltrated into the cyber networks of the Iranian centrifuges and screw them up. And that this wouldn't kill anybody, wouldn't hurt anybody, but it would really damage the machines. And that this could at least buy time. It would delay the acquisition of enough weapons to be by the Iranians. Bush was interested in this, not only that it would slow down the Iranian nuclear program, but Bush and then later Obama became deeply concerned that under Netanyahu, the prime minister then, who was just elected again last night, uh, making it was the longest serving prime minister in Israeli history. Now. Very controversial guy, it's a whole other story. Uh, Obama's relationship with Netanyahu was very poor. And unlike today, where Trump's relationship with Netanyahu is excellent. Uh, Obama was very concerned that Netanyahu was preparing a military attack on these facilities. And he thought this could lead to a major war in the Middle East. Huge damage and destruction, the US would get involved, it would be a mess. So Obama learned about Cart Cartwright's role in getting Bush to agree to the so-called Stuxnet attack, the use of the worm to attack the centrifuges. And, Cart and Obama was even more supportive than Bush was he thought not only would it delay the Iranian nuclear program, but it would reassure Israel that we were serious about delaying the program and, and dissuade the Israelis from attacking Iran. You got all that? Everybody sort of with me? Maybe, I'm not sure you were. Okay. I have a comment. Uh, yes. So, during that time, uh, North Korea had a more state-of-art uranium enrichment facilities right. than Iran. Iran had a, around a Gen 2, but North Korea has Gen 3. So the international community was worried about uh, North Korea's uh, import of nuclear technology to Iran. Right. So North Korea, rather than contacting Iran, North Korea contacted Israelis. and. Uh, a group of North Korean diplomats went to Israel and negotiated with them. I didn't know that. You didn't know that? So North Korean diplomats just said that uh, if you didn't give us $1 billion, we're going to sell uh, our nuclear technology to Iran. Right. Huh. So Israel said, yes, we can. We, we, we couldn't give you $1 billion, but we could give you materials and uh, other resources, which is is the same as a one billion dollars. Uh, so I don't know afterwards, but uh, so Tae Young Ho, who defected the North yeah, Korea right. four years ago, he uh, testimony that in his book. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that is a North Korea some strategy. Well, there never was a deal from, complete between Israel and North Korea, but then North Korea turned and provided a nuclear react to Syria. Right which the Israeli intelligence learned about before CIA learned about. And the Israelis bombed that facility. And uh, the Syrians never admitted that it had a facility, never admitted it had been bombed, never admitted anything about it. And the Israelis didn't either. But it definitely had happened. <laughs> See all the complexities of nuclear proliferation? It's not quite so simple. Um, uh, yes. If you had control over a centrifuge, why wouldn't you actually just like, why would you blow it up? If I had machine control over something like that, why would they like if they if they're doing it and I'm like the centrifuge guy and I'm like, hey, it keeps messing up and I don't know why. When they yeah, really fix it, but if it blows up and it takes out all the other. Well, stuff. that was Syria. That was totally different than Iran. No, I'm talking about the cyber attacks. The cyber attack initially was viewed as some equipment malfunction by the Iranians. They didn't know why their machines were malfunctioning. 
It took them a very long time to understand that they were under cyber attack. They'd never been attacked. Didn't they make it seem like the center of gravity was slightly off? So once it started spinning, yes, yeah. right, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. right. But if they, why wouldn't you just? Yeah. The street versus center of gravity. It's not. It's not an accident. Yeah, but they obviously didn't know it was a cyber. Right. 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 They didn't want to start a conflict. Well, <laughs> they, had, they had a plan. They had a clandestine, you know, system. But let me say this. Number one, the United States has never acknowledged that there was a Stuxnet attack. Uh, Israel has never acknowledged that there was a Stuxnet attack. <laughs> and Iran has never acknowledged that they were the subject of a Stuxnet attack. Also, the Syrians have been continuously The Syrian situation was different where the Israeli, the Israeli intelligence went to Obama no, it was under Bush, and informed them that they were going to attack the Syrian reactor. Syria is a long time adversary of Israel since the founding of Israel in 1948. Uh, and Syria never acknowledged that the facility was bombed. So it's a little different between Syria and Iran. In the meantime, uh, under primarily under Obama, there was a very aggressive effort to impose very harmful economic sanctions against the right. They've been told that they're involved in a clandestine weapons program, which is in violation of the NPT. They're members of the NPT. This is a violation of the agreement. Uh, after several years of these economic sanctions, and this has never been admitted to by the Iranian government, uh, Obama, you know, Obama had made a statement during the 2008 election campaign, which he was running against Hillary Clinton for the nomination, which she ridiculed. And Obama said, I'd be willing to go talk to the Iranians. I'd be willing to go talk to the Ayatollah. And she said, that's preposterous, that's naive. That's what someone doesn't know anything about diplomacy. You have to get a lot before you go. You have small level, low level people build up and all that. This was historically the way it was done. It's interesting because then Trump did the same thing with the uh, Trump. John mm -hmm. No, no planning, and boom, he went to see him. In any event, the people who have been involved in the details of this tonight met some of them literature claim that it was dominated by economic hardship from the sanctions that led the Iranian government to decide to negotiate with the U.S. about the nuclear program. And this went on for three years, and in 2015, and also the U.S. wanted to make it a multilateral agreement. Here are some of the key players. This is Secretary of State Kerry, Secretary of State John Kerry under Obama. This is Ernie Moniz, who is a nuclear engineer from MIT, who had been appointed Secretary of Energy under Obama, who did a lot of the detailed negotiations. I think this was Stolt this was Stoltenberg, who was the uh, Secretary General of, the, of NATO. This is uh, the Russian uh, foreign minister. Uh, this is the uh, Iranian, these are the Iranian negotiators. One of these Iranian negotiators has a degree from San Francisco State, actually. Um, and not here, but very important, was Wendy Sherman, and I asked you to read Wendy Sherman's book. She was deeply involved in both the Iranian negotiations and discussions with the North Koreans. Uh, it was a very complex formula and framework, multilateral, the US, Russia, China, UK, and France, those are the P5, the five nuclear weapon states, plus Germany, which is a non-nuclear weapon state, plus the European Union, plus Iran. 
multilateral negotiation using the Greek framework in July 2015. Uh, and uh, in, uh, I'm sorry, in McFall's book is for a different class. If you read Michael McFall's book, he was US ambassador to Russia. He explains the important role of Russian support for the JCPOA. So the Russians were not mischievous in this case. They wanted to stop the Iranian nuclear program. This itself, the J a JCPOA, is a joint comprehensive plan of action. Uh, it was signed in 2015. And once Iran signed, they received over a billion dollars in uh, sort of reparations for the cost of economic sanctions. And this got Trump very angry when he was a campaign candidate. And the 2016 election, Trump said this was one of the most preposterous, fake, you know, those fancy language without any content to it. Uh, ridiculous agreements ever made by the United States in its 220 year history. And that if he was ever elected, he would cancel the agreement, which he did. So in 2018, just six months ago, he ordered the United States to withdraw from the JCPOA. But the JCPOA, this multilateral agreement, was almost out of play. Now, some folks, I would put myself in one of them, thought that if the U.S. withdrew from the JCPOA, it would be unlikely that the JCPOA would hold. The other countries would pull out, and Iran would be back to its nuclear weapons acquisition program. But in fact, so far, that's been wrong. Every other member of the JCPOA, except the United States, is still in the agreement. Iran is still in the agreement. And the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which uh, monitors compliance with international nuclear treaties, has asserted several times that there's no evidence whatever that Iran is in violation of JCPOA. So this is a moving target. It's, yes. So wasn't that money that we brought back over the frozen assets that we had that we received because of Yes. Okay. Right. But it wasn't money that like- There wasn't the decent money that we provided, no. Yes. Uh, um, do you think that's going to change so the U.S. Um, has, like, actually started building economic sanctions in March, like this March? Say it again? The U.S. has started building economic sanctions. New economic sanctions against Iran. Iran. Do you think that's going to be really against Iran? Do you think that's going to be really against Iran? You know, I don't know. I think it's a very... Uh, whether there's been another development just happened since this, and that is the Revolutionary Guard, which is the key military and economic arm for the Ayatollah, has been declared a terrorist group by Trump. And that has implications for American law against Iran. I mean, I, you know, Trump has a much more vehement, comprehensive anti-Iranian policy than Obama did. And, you know, uh, you're in a pretty dicey part of the world here. And uh, you know, armed conflict could, could erupt easily. It could erupt between Iran and Israel. Um, it could even erupt between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And the US could be involved. It's a very, very dangerous top priority area for US policy and US nuclear policy. Any other questions or comments? On this? How many of you are very familiar with all this material I've given you? Almost nobody. Okay. What? I'm sorry, say it again. It's my area of the final project. It's your area of the final project. Yes. So here is some of the stipulated parts of the JCPOA. The JCPOA. Uh, mandated that Iran eliminate the stockpile of medium and rich uranium. Uranium uh, and rich to about 20% of E235. Uh, Iran cut its stockpile of low and rich uranium by 98%. It accumulated a lot of uranium. It reduced by two thirds the number of centrifuges, though this would take place over a long period of time. 
uh, Iran permitted IAE to have 150 inspectors uh, access all of the facilities. And it's uh, also this is by, uh, uh, you know, you don't have to go and give them a long warning time before inspecting. Uh, the Iran will continue to do research on enrichment. Uh, there was a cessation of UN and US economic sanctions with Iran, which, as you said, the US has now resumed. Obama continued to deter the Iran nuclear program, and uh, Iran received two billion dollars. There are other aspects of the JCPOA, but these are some of the main. And that's it. That's all I have. So, uh, so if you want to come in, in parallel with this, of course, you have um, the missile program, right? Um, which is obviously interpreted as signaling intent. Did you want to comment a little bit on the that part of the matrix? Right. So, other aspects of the Iranian. Uh, effort that concern the United States to, um, first of all, they have greatly enlarged their regional uh, approach to growing allies in the region. Right? Um, in Yemen, you is vaguely familiar with the civil war in Yemen. Uh, the Saudis are supporting the government, the Iranians support the Houthi rebels. Uh, and it's been a huge fight, and there's been mass slaughter of the civilian population in Yemen. Thousands and thousands of young children, hospitals have been bombed, mosques have been destroyed. It's been just brutal. Yemen is the poorest country in the whole Arab world. So that's a piece of the Saudi uh, Iranian struggle to control the Middle East and the US under Trump. Is a thousand percent on the side of the Saudis. Even though it was the Saudis who killed the Washington Post journalist, the Saudis who have a uh, still a very uh, you know, deeply uh, religious uh, political ideology. Um, but this, the Iranians are opposing that. So, you know, you see Saudi versus Iran, this is. Arab versus Persian. This is Sunni versus Shia. And this is sort of pro Western, pro American versus anti American. Three dimensions of the struggle. Uh, the Iranians are deeply involved in relations with Iraq. Oh, this is. Oh, when did we have this? Uh, so you have three more slides. Oh, I have three more slides. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. Okay. So here, yeah, that's what I was. So here, um, the Iranians, of course, have been involved with the Russians and Hezbollah. The Shia group in Lebanon in supporting Assad in Syria. And the US policy is one of the key in Syria. Obama had said Assad must leave. We have to have a resolution to the conflict. Assad hasn't left. He's been supported by the Russians, the Iranians, and Hezbollah. Russia has won and the US has lost in Syria. It's a great victory for the Iranians. Um, support of Assad in Syria, collaboration in Russia, close to the Golan Heights. Now, close to the Golan Heights. And the Golan Heights was just named by Trump as being legitimate Israeli territory. This has never happened before. Golan Heights is, Karen, I've been to the Golan Heights. Golan Heights is a big mountainous region on the border between Syria and Israel. Israel took the Golan Heights in the 73 war, in the Syrian territory. They took the Golan Heights because they were being attacked from the Golan Heights. But there's no country in the world other than the United States and Israel 
that recognizes Israeli control, Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. Um, and they strengthened Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, this is all, it's a Shia community within Lebanon. It's a very large population of Shia. So the point I'm making here is that Iran has a regional strategy to spread its allies and doctrine throughout the region. And this is what Saudi Arabia is confronting. Uh, it's the Houthi rebels in this Yemen that I mentioned. Great influence over the Iraqi Shia. Remember, Iraq had been run by Saddam Hussein, who was a Sunni. But after Iraq was, over, Iraq was overthrown, Saddam was overthrown by the United States, they had a free election, and they're mostly Shia, and they elected a Shia government. And the Shia government is closely in contact with Tehran. So, bottom line, Iran has made major, major diplomatic gains in the Middle East in the last number of years, hugely extending their power and influence. And they even support some Sunnis. They support the Hamas group in the Gaza Strip, which is Sunni, but deeply against the vow to uh, defeat Israel. Here, uh, I think this might be the last slide. We did go in support of terrorism. So what, I, so what I didn't mention in this is Carl's point about their missile program. Okay. Iran has a very, very active missile program. The missile program was never included in the JCPOA. JCPOA was only about nuclear weapons. And the missile program has always been a criticism of the JCPOA that it should have been included and was not. And Trump actually attacked the agreement for not including the missile program. And they have a variety of different kinds of intermediate range missiles that can now attack almost all the targets in, in Western Europe. This is a non-trivial capability. It's a very sophisticated capability. They have a very, very active missile program. So what is Trump trying to do to bring it up to current times? He's trying to work with Saudi Arabia and Israel and others against Iran. This may or may not be the right policy, but that's what it is for the United States at the moment. Which means we are immersed in a lot of these activities now. We're providing funds and weapons to the Saudis to fight against the Houthis in Yemen. Now, the Congress, I think, just put in last week I don't know if anyone knows the details, suspended or terminated U.S. support for Saudi weapons in, in Yemen. And this is what's related to the fact that the, uh, uh, the Washington Post correspondent was axed and uh, dismembered. Uh, and this has led to congressional, bipartisan congressional opposition to Trump's Saudi policy. There's an article from Foreign Policy on how the Gulf states got in bed with Israel and forgot about the Palestinian voters. Yeah, this is a, a major development in recent years. All these countries, all these countries have been vehemently anti Israeli. But now they're collaborating with Israel, they're collaborating with Israel against Iraq. There's a lot of major shifts in the region. Now, the, the most inflammatory thing that just happened, Netanyahu ran on a platform that he would seize some of the Palestinian uh, territory in the West Bank. This is also completely illegal uh, based upon uh, International law, if you seize territory, you can't just claim it as your own. It's like the Russians claiming Crimea as part of Russia. And just yesterday, he won re election. Now he's under indictment. And he and Trump could be in the next jail cells next to each other. But uh, it's not clear. He now has to form a coalition. Israel has complex, uh, multi party system. But it's likely he'll have a coalition to form another government. 
He didn't win by a lot, but he won. So this will be more inflammatory in the region. Other points? Uh, um, this is the last. Uh, yeah, so Israel is building ties with anti, so it's back to sell, anti Iranian Arab states. So the U.S. non-cooperation, and actually what we haven't discussed, we haven't discussed Turkey or Egypt. Uh, when I was leaving the government back in 2010, that's a long time ago now, it's nine years ago, I was at a meeting where the, uh, where the Saudi defense attache in the Saudi embassy in Washington came up to me and said, I want you to know that if you can't stop Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons, we will acquire them 100%. And they've told many people that, not just Michael Bond. It's thought that likely that they couldn't build it, they don't have an indigenous technical community to do it. But they buy them probably from Pakistan. That's assuming Pakistan's willing to sell them. Pakistan at the moment is the only Islamic state with nuclear weapons. So do they want to water down their status as an Islamic nuclear weapon state by selling them to the Saudis? Unclear, but they do have very good relations. Pakistan and Saudi relations directly. So this is a highly inflammatory region of possible nuclear weapon use. Yes. What about the United Arab Emirates? United Arab Emirates are an important uh, Gulf state. They supported, I believe, the Saudis. Uh, one of them that hasn't is, is uh, Qatar. Where's Qatar? The peninsula. The, 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 the pink. Yeah, there. Qatar, yeah. yeah. Qatar has been accused by the Saudis of collaborating with various terrorist groups. And uh, and a lot of these Gulf states and the Saudis have an economic embargo against Qatar. Um, I, have you spent time in this part of the world? No. no. I spent a little time. I've been to Qatar. I've been to the United Arab Emirates. Who's the United Arab Emirates? The cold one. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, there's this fabulous wealth. Is, you know, mind shattering wealth on the surface. Uh, they're also they're not known as being super hard workers. They're very good at writing checks. They want something done, write a check. The the oil wealth is staggering. You've got most of the people who do the work are foreign laborers. Pakistan filled with Filipinos filled with Pakistanis. Um, this is, you know, it's so complex. This is not an area where the simple American brain tends to do well. You know, I would say as a former engineer, I would say American governments like engineers, black and white. What's the correct answer? Go get it, solve the problem, forget about it. This is a set of conditions that have been around for a couple of thousand years. They're not going to get resolved anytime soon. And just to make life slightly more complicated, uh, um, the son-in-law of uh, Trump, what's his name? Kushner. 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 Jared, Jared Kushner has gone to Saudi Arabia and to a number of these states, presumably for loans for his own private businesses. It was <laughs> totally illegal, but this is uh, the way uh, the Trump administration does business. The emoluments clause calls for no government official to act in any way on behalf of US policy 
that can enrich themselves. And there are several thousand counterexamples right now in the two years on the Trump. Most probably just the Trump Hotel that's just a few blocks from the White House. So you suddenly have this incredible flood of foreign diplomats all happen to want to stay in the Trump Hotel. And you know, all those bills, all that income goes into Trump's pocket. So a lot of this policy under Trump, uniquely under Trump, is a reflection of his own and his family's own personal economic interests, not in terms of US policy. Where does Netanyahu's recent re-election, do you see any possible conditions where Iran and Israel at some point start the regime or at least you know, you never say never, anything yeah. can possibly happen, but you know, I mean, the whole Iranian revolution is in part built on uh, anti-Israeli destruction of Israel. Netanyahu, you have to understand Netanyahu, Netanyahu's father was a member of the most extreme anti-British group during the Palestine mandate. Um, and uh, Later on, his brother was killed in an attack in, uh, in Tebi, the famous Tebi raid. So he is a hyper hard liner and sees himself as like the Churchill protecting Israeli sovereignty. And he's now been reelected a number of times. The more liberal negoti negotiation pacts in Israel are very weak. So I don't see any prospect of uh, negotiation between Israel and Iran. I'd love to be surprised, but I just don't think so. Speaking of um, the American mind not doing well here, one thing that does not serve us well is Americans have no sense of history. You know, we want to fix the problem, as Professor Knox said, and move on. <clears throat> a few years ago, there was a two part series done by uh, um, the BBC called In Search of Alexander, which is about a four hour long documentary where a historian who uh, actually went uh, from, uh, started in Mesopotamia, went all the way through, even places you had to get permission to look at the sites where he under, had his military, uh, yeah, military conquests. It was a fascinating series, mm -hmm. you know, it was 